Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are, continuing our discussion of thermoplastic processing methods. Now, I just wanted to kind of go over some of these slides with you briefly. I know we went into depth with respect to the, extrus the extruder screw and or uh, in plastic injection molding last week. Uh, I'll just kind of go over these slides with you just briefly. I actually, I edited these slides, uh, changed some things, deleted some things, cut some things, added some things. So I sent you the new version of these revised slash edited slides uh, just about 30 minutes ago vis-a-vis -vis your email account. So at any rate, let's get started. Uh, basically, this is just about plastic products, uh, all the different types of products that are capable um, and as you well know, many parts uh, that usually were made out of metals, more traditional material, are, are now being made from plastics, a wide variety of different plastics, a wide variety of thermoplastics, especially. And uh, the nice thing about this, of course, is that, you know, usually in these thermoplastic processes, uh, you're going to get uh, a near or net shape process. In other words, you're going to get the part, whatever that part is, it's going to take a one-step process to get that part uh, out and uh, into a box ready to be shipped. So very, very quick, very, very rapid, uh, very, very efficient uh, once it's all uh, uh, tuned in. Okay, as we know, there's thermo two, thermo two types of plastics. Thermoplastics, which is what we're uh, uh, talking about today and then thermosets which is what we talk more about uh, uh, when we start talking about polymer matrix composites because they primarily use thermoset type materials but today it's all about thermoplastics the plastics just undergo a physical change when uh, heat is added to them in order to uh, melt them and cause them to have viscoelastic properties primarily viscosity we'll talk about and here it is uh, once this polymer melts, it's, uh, we call these all these thermoplastics. Most of these are melt processable. Most thermoplastics are, but not all. Uh, but there are a couple of properties you need to be aware of, and viscosity is one of them, of course, uh, because now you're taking a solid thermoplastic, melting it into a very thick uh, uh, liquid, uh, sometimes almost the viscosity is similar to honey. Uh, something like that, um, and uh, then you're trying to, under a great deal of uh, injection pressure that we mentioned last week, uh, trying to put it into very, very small little cavities, uh, passageways, etc. They're all inside of a, a molded product, so it can be a very difficult uh, procedure, um, and you need to be aware of the viscosity. Now, one thing uh, that's that's uh, also very important, probably most important uh, of these parameters, is called a melt flow index, or for short MFI, uh, and we'll talk about that. But again, this is just about viscosities and and the high viscosities that are that are present there, um, and this is showing the relationships of some of the of some of the uh, thermoplastics. Of course, there's nylon. Here's acrylic. Here's polypropylene and a low D, uh, LDPE, a low density polyethylene right here. So you can see as the temperature increases, uh, the viscosity goes way down. Of course, it gets thinner. Um, so, but this is a uh, very interesting, uh, this is how they basically, uh, people that are processing this stuff, like injection molding folks, need to know what that uh, thermoplastics MFI is because it's a relationship between uh, the uh, actual uh, uh, viscosity of the polymer melt and um, its molecular weight, okay? And the way they determine that is that they take a certain amount, they heat it up, and then they, they extrude it through a small little orifice onto a uh, just a flat plate or a platter uh, over a certain amount of time, and then they stop it, and then they actually just weigh that. So uh, if, the, if the plastic has a very, very, very high MFI, which means it had a lot of volume coming out, um, that would mean that it ha it's a very, very uh, significantly lower viscosity than something that had a low MFI number, which means not very much came out, which means it was a very, very, very high viscosity. So the, that's how that works. And so uh, a melt processor uh, 
uh, milk processing uh, uh, injection company, extruder company, needs to know what this is uh, based upon what kind of um, mold they're going through. Okay, so we talked about extrusion, uh, and this is this uh, full color picture of what we went over last week. An excellent, excellent picture. Went through that quite extensively, so we don't need to really go through all these uh, again. But just I would go through all these to kind of see and you know, uh, review what we talked about, um, and then we talked about the different sections: the feed section, compression section, the metering section. We talked all about that. And then the actual product coming out of just an extruder now is called the extrude date here. And you can do solid profiles, hollow profiles, wire and, wire and cable coatings, even sheets and films and filaments. Okay. Uh, and then again, the round, square, structural shapes, all kinds of different uh, uh, cross-sectional uh, shapes can be done through just like extrusion and, and metals. And here's a close-up of what that uh, looks like uh, going through at the end of this. And this is this is a, this uh, what they call a screen pack that just kind of puts this more in a laminar flow as it gets ready to go into through this orifice and into uh, out this die opening here. So whatever this die opening is right here, you would get this extrudate profile. Similar to again, like I said, extrusion. Here's one for hollow. Uh, and then we can do sheet and film too, uh, from about twenty thousandths of, uh, of an inch thick, so it's not very thick. Um, and so a lot of different um, uh, processes uh, or applications for sheet and film also. Okay, and then they're talking about some of the materials for sheet and film. Most of it's polyethylene, uh, lion's sherbet, low density, uh, some polypropylene, and some uh, vinyl. Okay, uh, so there's next they're going to show two different types. There's a slit die extrusion. That's how they make sheet and film, and then there's also the blown film extrusion process. So here it is. Here's the this is the end of this. This is where that extruder uh, barrel, the end of this was would be, and then it comes into this die, and you see how it kind of fans this out, thins it out, and so it comes out in a sort of a real thin sheet here as it comes through this thin section here as it expands through that this is interesting i told you all about this in class briefly maybe uh before we had to leave maybe not probably didn't because i think we're still talking about welding at the time uh but at any rate um so this is interesting because this is how we get all of our plastic bags uh and it's, it's a very unique process uh a very kind of a, a interesting challenging process to start this up and and we'll show show it to you uh here's a cross section of it again starts with the extruder comes out through here and has this little uh, turns this from a horizontal to a vertical uh, extrusion that goes up through here uh there is air being forced through this thing uh, and so basically what it's doing is it's blowing this up like a big balloon kind of a thing and it goes up uh, of course this is completely uh, circular uh, and so you get this big hollow balloon kind of thing going all the way up here now we're talking distance from from this extruder all the way to the top many times easily 30 40 feet in the air okay it needs that amount of time to get all the way up here so that both sides the interior and the exterior of this film completely solidifies before shrinking it back down and rolling it through these pinch rollers and then rolling it back down and then finally into a wind-up reel over here. So it's a very interesting process. Uh, you should uh, YouTube this and, and look at some of these in real real life. Uh, they're really interesting to see. Okay, so then we finally get to injection molding. We talked about this in great detail. Uh, we talked about the cycle times, uh, a lot of really quick cycle times, sometimes even less than 10 seconds, up to 30 seconds. But again, sometimes it takes all the way up to a minute or, or more on large, large uh, uh, dyes and molds. Okay, uh, of course, the injection molded parts, they can do very, very simple parts, something as simple as a Frisbee. Uh, all the way to something very, very, very intricate, uh, you know, uh, for dental procedures and such as that. Uh, all kinds of small, very, very intricate, challenging pieces, small pieces, large pieces. Uh, so it runs quite the gamut with respect to size and complexity on these on these injection molded parts. Okay, 
uh, from two ounces all the way up to more than 50 pounds are possible. And there's a little sampling of different little pieces and components and parts. Now, I left this in there because it is the most widely used molding process for all thermoplastics. This injection molding is, okay? So you just need to know that because there's so much, so many products come out of these machines. Uh, and it's just a marvelous, marvelous process, especially if you're a mechanical engineer type. All right, so as we said before, there's two types, two uh, components to injection molding between the injection and clamping. We went through all those in detail. This is one of the reasons I brought this forward. I wanted to show you this. This is a human bean, not a pinto bean, black bean. This is a human bean right here, okay? Uh, look at the size of this piece of equipment, okay? This is a massive, obviously massive injection molding machine. You'd be making something like those uh, plastic outdoor chairs, uh, perhaps even 55-gallon uh, uh, trash containers, stuff like this, would be coming out of a machine this large. Okay, uh, yeah, and this is a 3,000-ton capacity machine right here. Now, as you'll see here in a minute, in one of the slides, the, the these machines are classified or rated or named. Uh, by their clamping tonnage. This represents a clamping tonnage capacity. So this has the capacity to exert 3,000 tons of sheer of force into those two mold halves uh, to keep them closed while it's being injected uh, under high pressure. Okay. And again, here's the nice, uh, again, the same thing we went through last week in great detail. We went through this, the injection unit, the clamping unit, different types of clamping units that we have. Um, and this is just showing, you know, this cycle. Uh, here's mold, mold that is closed. Here's the mold. Here comes the, uh, you know, the polymer melt is here. And it's about to act like an injection, truly an injection unit, like a syringe kind of thing. And moving forward, uh, extrudes this or pushes this material into the die cavity here. Uh, and then there's this non-return valve that keeps it keeps it pressurized until it till it till this begins to solidify off right here at this uh, right here at the gate between the this die and the uh, mold half here, uh, and then it pulls back, uh, and then here comes some more material as it as it starts to turn again and uh, brings more material up here and the whole cycle starts over again. Okay, so uh, now the part is ready to be injected. And so uh, this, this is stationary half of the mold, and this is the moving platen that goes back and forth. And usually when this thing pulls out, there are pins that push these, these parts out. They're called injector pins. And there's a, a better close-up view of that here coming up. And here is a, a, a close-up of the mold, two mold halves here. And these are these ejector pins. See these right here? These are the ejector pins. And you see them, and they're attached to this plate right here. So when this pulls back, this this is going back this way, and this these pins push this part out, as you can see here. Okay, so as this pulls out, this this piece, you know, stays stationary, but the pins push this part out. All right. Now these are these are probably the only part, these little U-shaped pieces are the actual molded parts. The rest of this consists of the gate and the uh, runners and the sprues here, sprues and the runners, and all that is simply just cut off and then recycled, uh, put back and grind it up, ground up and then recycled into the hopper and used again, if the part uh, specifications allow it. And that would be a, you know, a possibility. Okay, and here's these ejector pins again. The built to moving half of the mold usually accomplish this function to remove that material as it uh, the part as it comes out of that die or the mold. Okay, uh, and then again, these are injection. The they're based on the clamping tonnage, and uh, you know here we know this and pressure is equal to force divided by area. Well, this 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 injection pressure is what's going being injected by the by the machine by the extruder screw but as a result you get this force which is just going to be the injection pressure time the mold area now this mold area if you recall from your days of uh of solids maybe uh, that 
it's a bearing stress okay so this is a what we call a projected area across that whole mold open mold cavity so that's the area we're talking about times this injection pressure is going to yield a clamping tonnage so you have to obviously size the mold for the type of for the size of machine you're going to be putting it in otherwise you could obviously have problems okay and these are just some shrinkage rates uh, here is a uh, blow molding process. This is also another interesting process. This is how all, all different types of containers, uh, bottles, uh, all kinds of things are made this way. There's two types. There's an extrusion blow molding like this. Here again, there's an extruder. It just blows out this piece that's a hollow section. These two mold halves clamp on it. It seals it off right here, pinches it right here, and then it's hit with air blows this out around the shape of that and as soon as it hits it this is obviously the mold is, is chilled and it completely solidifies and then opens up and then you've got a, a, a molded part or a bottle of some sort same thing here but 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 you're not really extruding it what you're doing is you're making a uh, an injection molded part uh, a preform what they call a preform and then it gets put into a similar machine it gets heated up uh, because it's solidified here, so it's going to have to be preheated. It's going to have to be heated up once it gets in here through induction processes. It gets heated up, and so then the air pressure hits it, blows it up against against the side walls here, and then chills, and then it opens up, and the bottle comes out. So here's a good example. This is obviously not this part that came of this because this is white. This is clear, but this is the preform. This is the injection molded preform here, and you can see it already has the threads molded in place. And then it would just be put in that machine, and then um, and then air pressure hit it once it gets once it gets hot enough, uh, and then blows it up against that side there. Okay. Again, these materials for blow molding products, I mean, uh, range in size from very very small bottles to 2,000 gallon uh, containers and tanks. A lot of most all your all your uh, vehicle uh, gasoline tanks are now made out of. Uh, I, uh, polymers and this blow molding process and most of them are um, polycarbonate okay or actually they're they're um, high density polyethylene HDPE okay and this is vacuum thermoforming it's just a plastic sheet it gets heated becomes very pliable it gets put down here apply a vacuum sucks through this thing and and you can see how it sucks through this thing and since it's very pliable it's heated it conforms to this shape and there you go you get a molded part pretty rapidly pretty quickly all right and let's talk about foamed uh, the only thing you really know here is that all thermoplastics are capable of being foamed all right and uh, of course because of that you get a lot of different uh, densities of these uh, foamed products and packaging especially okay uh, now here's some general product design guidelines of course strength and stiffness uh, not anywhere close to what what the metals are but uh, so you have to design things in uh, differently where stresses are being applied and so uh, it's a matter of a design practice not necessarily a processing issue and of course you need to worry about impact resistance um, the temperatures that these products are going to be on and then, of course, thermal expansion is a big deal. The other thing you have to worry about is degradation due to the sunshine because of uh, radiation. Uh, and so there are plenty of uh, uh, additives that go into thermoplastic uh, materials that will take care of that and minimize the degradation, uh, uh, oxidation uh, due to radiation from the sun. All right. Uh, all right. Now, one of the things you have to realize is that injection molding specifically, uh, you have a minimum production quantities and usually approximately 10,000 pieces or minimum because the molds are so expensive. Okay, the molds can easily cost ten to $15,000 just for a mold. Okay. And in, uh, but, but part complexity is definitely an advantage because we can do a wide, as we mentioned before, a wide variety of parts, uh, complexities, both thin parts, thick parts, large parts, awkward parts. I mean, there's this probably, you know, unlimited amount of geometric designs that can be produced through this. The only thing you have to remember is it has to come out of the mold, be able to come out of the mold. Similar to, you know, powdered metallurgy, and we talked about that. 
So the things you have to worry about are wall thickness and then designing reinforcing ribs because of the to in order to increase the stiffness and strength on polymers as opposed to metals. All right, and then as always, corner radii and, and fillets or, or sharp corners are not good. Uh, holes are also uh, can be done, but uh, again, they complicate the uh, part removal when you have holes in, in injection molded parts. Okay, uh, we know a little bit about draft based from our casting processes, and that is it. So there'll be a few more and we'll uh, talk to you about moving forward with, uh, I sent you these slides on the composites and that and then we'll go over those next. Okay.